Okay, Mark. Oh, thank you. You guys can hear me okay? Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're here today, especially Mary. So good to see you. Okay, let's pray first. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the good things that you give us that are still on this earth, the beauty that we see around us, and um, I'm grateful for food that grows up out of the ground and um, for the love of family and friends and the promises that you put in the Bible um, about our future, our true future and our true home. Be with us today and uh, your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, first of all, you should know Plants and me, not. My, my family jokes to me, plants are, come to my house to die. I, I love the way they look. I like taking pictures of them. They're beautiful. I appreciate the beauty, but I just do not think about them until they're like dying. And by then it's usually too late. <laughs> but, um, but here's what I've learned in my short experience of gardening. Let me see if I can find a, ah, thank you Grant for the clicker. So I found an amazing verse this week I want to share with you. I had never run across this before. Um, it's amazing how you find something different every time and uh, that you go through the Bible. Hosea 10, 12 and 13. I'll give you a minute if you want to, but um, so Hosea 12 says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap according to kindness, break up your fallow ground, your unused waiting ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you. I've read the Bible many times, but this has never struck me before, and um, I, it's worth going back and reading it in context, because Hosea was a prophet during difficult and evil times in his country, and, um, and this is what Hosea had to say about that. Um, verse 13 says, <clears throat> because you have plowed wickedness, and you've reaped iniquity. You've eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your way in the multitude of your mighty men. Again, you should probably go and read that in context, but I want you to note the picture. This is a picture of part of my garden. There's flowers there, um, but this is the result of looking at a small patch of weeds and thinking, you know, I'm really not sure if those are good ones and they're supposed to be there, or if they're not good ones and they're not supposed to be there. This one happens to be uh, what they call sour weed, and it, it has a lemony flavor, and people actually use it in food, the, the leaves. But I did not realize that if you let it go, it will just take over everything and choke out everything. And now I'm trying to try and get it up with a shovel and a rake and lots of sweat trying to get those out of there. I'm, I'm, I'm repenting my year or two of leaving them alone. <laughs> um, so here's the first one, get them early. <laughs> When they're little and their roots are short, it's so much easier to get them out then than if you let them establish themselves. And I mean, okay, disclaimer, you people already probably know all of that and there are super gardeners out there. In fact, I, uh, where's Mrs. Kegley? I have seen your garden and it's 
absolutely perfect and gorgeous. I love it. Yes. So, so forgive me. And if you know all this stuff already, just enjoy. <laughs> so habits, your brain works in this way. You do something a couple, three times, your brain says, oh, we're going that way. And it enlarges those pathways and shrinks other pathways so that it becomes a habit. It's easier. It's actually physically easier for you to do that thing than the other thing. Bad habits can be rooted out early so much easier than if you wait until it's an established habit and those roots are deep. Um, again, be good at identifying the good versus the bad. I have things all over my yard that I said, you know, I'm just really not sure. Is that a flower or not? Or is it a good thing or not? Let's just let it grow up a little bit and then I'll see. And I'll pull it later, much to my husband's chagrin. Um, and uh, just because it has flowers, doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> now, I know some people who will say that it's not a weed, it's just a misplaced plant, okay? But some of them are actually bad, right? Yep. They're so pretty, and they're so good at holding the ground down. Um, in fact, sometimes you need a truck and a towing chain to get them out. <laughs> Another one that's, well, it's really not any easier to get out when it's little, but it's a lot easier to get it out when it's small than it is when it's big, right? This one, you can see, can you see that road way down the hillside? to give you some perspective about how big that plant is right there. But, and the other ones, I really don't know what they are. But I know that if I leave them too long, they make goat heads, right? Those super prickly, right? Right now they have little tiny, pretty little purple flowers on them that look like little irises. But I have to get those out before they turn into something that's gonna show up in the dog's coat and in my carpet and all over the place. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because sin at first is very attractive. It pulls on something that's inside us, some need or want or, or something. It, it pulls on something that, that draws us to it and everybody else is doing it or this other guy or girl or whatever has been doing this for a long time and they seem okay. Well, we don't know what's going on on the inside, do we? <laughs> but it, it looks attractive. Satan is a very good fisherman and a very good attractor. And, and, but what happens is once we let these grow and, and establish themselves then the flowers drop off and all that's left is the pain of dealing with these habits that we have allowed to establish. We hurt our friends, we hurt our family, we hurt ourselves with these things. Um, and, you know, even, even mild things, um, C.S. Lewis has a quote I like. Uh, he says that God doesn't have to turn you into a thief if a card player will do. You know, it, even these, some of these things that we do that aren't like murder and other things out of the Ten Commandments, uh, and they keep us from God's highest best. If we're busy doing something or reading something or, or doing something that's not part of God's plan for us, that makes things difficult for God to get the job done that he wanted us to do. Um, I, I tend to read too much or maybe watch too much TV, and I'm not hurting anybody else, I think, by doing that, but what am I not doing if I'm sitting watching TV? I'm not calling somebody else. I'm not visiting with somebody else. I'm not 
thinking about what I need to be doing weeks from now or a year from now. Um, the, the other thing I learned is never give up. Weeds take constant pulling and constant attention. A garden needs constant attention. Maybe that's my problem with a garden, constant attention. I'm really great at going out once in a while and doing a whole bunch of work, and then I'll ignore it for another month, which doesn't really work if you're trying to grow pretty flowers or food or anything like that. <clears throat> so let's go to um, Luke 18. Luke 18, the parable of the woman and the judge. <clears throat> Jesus spoke a parable to them saying, the lesson was they must always pray and not give up. And here's the story. There was a judge in a certain city who didn't fear God and didn't respect man. A widow was in that city and she often came to him saying, defend me from my adversary. And he wouldn't. Get out of my face, woman. He wouldn't. But after a while, he said to himself afterwards, after he'd turned him away, she said, even though I don't respect God or man, because this widow bothers me, I will defend her, or else she will wear me out with her continual coming. God isn't like that judge. God is predisposed in your favor. God wants to answer your godly prayers. But don't give up. Galatians 6, 9. I'm going to start with 8. For he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let's not be weary in doing good, for we will reap in due season if we don't give up. Let's not be weary in doing good, for we will reap, we will reap in due season if we don't give up. Sometimes I think God is testing in our persistence. Is this something that you really, really want to happen? Or is this just like a passing thing and you're gonna forget about it in a couple of days? Or is this really something that's really gonna be good for you and accomp help accomplish my mission for the earth and for you? Or is this something like a small child that you want but that's not going to be very helpful for you. So we be persistent in our prayer. And remember Daniel? Daniel fasted for three weeks, waiting for an answer to his prayer. And that one turned out to be the wait happened because that messenger was held up in another kingdom, fighting the emissary of that other kingdom until Michael Daniel's prince came to swap him out so that he could come and give Daniel the answer to his prayer, an interpretation of a dream that God wanted him to know. So don't give up. I, you know, I can't, I have been praying for my children since they were born, since before they were born. And none of them are in the church right now. And some of them are doing destructive and terrible things to each other and us. But you don't give up. God knows where they are. God knows what they need. God knows who, if it's not you, to get a hold of them and bring them to himself. This is his wish, is that everyone comes to him, that everyone gets to live forever. Referring back to that previous picture, that which is not actively discouraged will flourish, especially if it's bad. I don't know why that is. 
But, for instance, it's common knowledge right now that if you tax something, you'll discourage it. If you don't tax something, you encourage it. Uh, if there's this thing called the, the Kubler-Ross change curve. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It, it's um, been presented to me most times um, through a, it's a grief cycle, but it's, it's an acceptance cycle. Um, it, it goes through several phases. First, you have shock and denial, then anger, then fear or bargaining, then depression, and then it, the curve starts to go up. Then you have acceptance, and then I'm gonna push it a little further, and from acceptance then, especially in social life or uh, political correctness, then you have promotion, and then after that you have punishment for those who aren't with the program. That happens in many places in, in, well, never mind. In our society today, I'm sure you can look around and find some examples of that going on. So these verses here, um, going back to the beginning, <clears throat> the Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was continually only evil, and it grieved God in his heart that he had made man, and he decided to start over, and then promised after that that he wasn't going to do that again. But we look forward to Jesus coming to the righteous judge who will make all things right and restore everything to, to the perfection that it was at the beginning. And... Um, Sometimes I feel like the church in general, by accepting what's going on in, the, in society, we, we kind of maybe slide towards that curve of acceptance and then promotion. And, and that worries me a little bit. Okay, next. We all know <clears throat> that sometimes pruning is necessary. How many of us enjoy that pruning? Not me. Not me. Okay, let's go to John 15, 2 and 3. John 15, 2 and 3. This is Jesus talking. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. And Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, You are already pruned clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And this picture is an a picture of a, uh, that looks like an apple tree to me, that's been pruned clean. Every excess branch has been trimmed off. It's been trimmed in such a way to make it easy to pick the fruit and in a way so that each, each fruit that's growing has access to sun and light. This is necessary in order to produce more and better fruit. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said that. And... Um, the other one is, is uh, Luke 13, 7. Luke 13, 7, I'm going to start with 6. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. So he said to the vine dresser, or the, the orchardist, Behold, these three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why waste the soil? Now, we know that that had a good outcome, but I'm going to stop there. This is why pruning is necessary. 
And there is coming a time, unfortunately, when some serious pruning is gonna happen. Um, and let's see, let's go to Mark 9.43. Sorry, this is one of the downfalls. Goodness. Okay. Mark 943. <clears throat> pruning. We're talking about pruning. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having your two hands go into the fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life lame rather than having your two feet to be cast into the flames. And 47, if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It's better for you to enter into God's kingdom with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire. Harsh. Oh, man, that sounds harsh. Is Jesus really saying, go ahead and cut off your foot? No. What he's saying is these things that you think are super important to you, even if it's a person, family members or people, friends, especially, this is really important for people who have let those weeds grow up and they have bad habits. Oftentimes, part of the process is letting go of those friends that lead you to continue doing the things that you're not supposed to do or that you know you're convicted in your heart that you're not supposed to do. It's better to go into eternal life without those people or without that thing, or whatever it is, than to hang on to it and lose out. I, I hate to say this, but I know several people, women in particular, who don't come to church, don't study their Bible, they don't pray, they don't sing at home because their husband wouldn't like it. And it's one thing to be kind and courteous and to show by example to your friends and your family the difference that Jesus makes in your life, but to make them more important than following Jesus is not what he said. He said anybody who loves mother or father or son or whatever more than me isn't worthy of me. And that sounds really harsh, but his goal, his goal is to bring you into the kingdom. That's so much more important than anything we have here. Um, he also says, uh, let's see. Oh, let's go into Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 25 to 30 is the story of the um, wheat and the tares. The parable of the wheat and the tares. We know this story. He said another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while people slept, his enemy came and so sowed, my version says, Darnell weeds, also among the wheat, and went away. I don't know what a Darnell weed is, but maybe it looks like that, what I had up there. No, 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 what did I do? Thank you. Save me, A.V. Thank you. So this is what, this is what my flower bed looks like right now. So we have, you can see some flowers there and some purposefully grown um, tall grass, but the lawn grass likes that garden bed too and a bunch of other things. So while people slept, his enemy came and sowed darnel weeds also among the wheat and went away. But when the blades sprang up and produced fruit, 
wheat. Then the darnel weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did these darnel weeds come from? He said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? And he said, No, lest perhaps while you gather up those weeds, you root up the wheat with them. Doesn't that happen sometimes? That happens sometimes. The wheat suffers because of the weeds. And the weeds right now benefit because of the wheat, because of the care and time and, and effort that goes into growing the wheat. The weeds that grow up in there too, right next to the wheat, they benefit from that. And sometimes they grow up too close together. You can't pull one without pulling the other. So the master said, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first gather up the weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So let's make sure that we're sowing wheat and being persistent to pull up the weeds and not giving up praying for the people we love. Now, plants are what they are. They are programmed to do what they do. They can't deviate from it without outside help, which humans have done. Who knows about like GMO, right? This is how they, now I'm, I, I should, I, I'm kind of neutral on the GMO thing, so don't take that as a, something against that, if you so choose. Uh, uh, but human beings have come up with, so how many versions of roses are there? Anybody know? How many? There's got to be a million, at least. And it all happened because humans changed things, right? They crossbred. They, they were very careful about what they did, purposefully changing it to make a different color or a different kind. And we've done that with the food we eat and the animals that some of us eat and, and those kinds of things. We have, they have had outside interference to change, OK? Praise God, we have outside interference so that we can change. We have, let's see, John 15, 26. Let's go to John 15, 26. John 15, 26. When the counselor has come, Jesus said, whom I will send you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And 16, 13. 16, 13 says, in a different place, he said, however, oh, well, okay, let's start with 12. Jesus told them, I still have many things to tell you, but I, you can't bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He hears from God. He'll speak to you. He will declare to you the things that are coming, and he will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine and will declare it to you. Aren't you glad? How wonderful is that, that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit who's available anytime. Every time you pray, every time you think in your heart you want to talk to God, and the Holy Spirit is there to tell you, this is the way, walk in that. When you let him use your will, when you give your will to God and you say, I want to follow you, 
The Holy Spirit is right there. Let's listen so that we can be changed on the inside and be a beautiful garden. This is from a couple years ago, I have to say. The beautiful garden. Now you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there are still that little patch of weeds. See how little that was way back there? That was little. And it took over that whole bed. But if you let it, the Holy Spirit will change you on the inside and lead you where you need to go and change us to be more and more like God and like Jesus every day. Um, let's go to Psalms. Psalms 51, 9 and 10 says, Hide your face from my sins, O God, and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for making it possible to change us on the inside. Thank you for your promises that you see us, not necessarily how we are now, but how we will be when your work is finished in us. Thank you for your promise that you're coming soon to make all things right. And thank you for this day. Be with us in our fellowship today. Help us always to be kind and loving and true to each other. In Jesus' name, amen.